Right? Can anyone tell me who that is? Do you recognize her? All right, she is Tracy Crouch. She is a member of parliament and she was appointed by Theresa May in January as this country's first minister of loneliness. First time this has ever happened. She made headlines around the world in January that we, the UK, would appoint a minister of loneliness. Now, I don't know what, our gov- what you think about our current government and their plans, but this, is a, this was an interesting one. So what they did was there was a major survey done in the UK, across the UK, and about, about our relationships, and they concluded this. They concluded that, um, that about 200,000 older people have no meaningful contact or conversation with family or friends in a typical month. 200,000 elderly people. We have a bunch of them around here. I don't know, but... If, if you want to be a part of something that does something f- over Christmas for older people, uh, we've done that before. I think we should do it again. There are about 9 million people, they concluded, in this country um, often have feelings of loneliness. And 85% of young disabled people and about half of generally disabled people have regular bouts of feeling lonely. Loneliness is a huge challenge, isn't it? I'm not sure if, if there was a survey done on you, on, on where you stand with in the area of loneliness. I'm not sure where, kind of what the results would be. How, how are you feeling? Are you, is, there, is that a word you would use about yourself? I certainly have used it about myself in, in, in moments. But uh, here's, so this is what some of the conclusions was. She says, Loneliness can affect anyone, regardless of age, gender, or background. We are determined to lead the way in addressing it. Now, we have heard politicians make those kind of statements before. Acknowledging the desperation felt by more than 9 million Britons, she said, Loneliness is not a problem that can be solved overnight, but we will not leave one stone unturned to build a more connected society for everyone. We will not leave one stone unturned to build a more connected society for everyone. Yeah, this is the Minister of Loneliness's commitment. This shocking statistic laid bare the extent of the crisis which has forced ministers to draw up a loneliness strategy. Central to its success to the loneliness strategy was this, says Mrs. Crouch is finding practical ways to help communities come together once the hallmark of Britain. So as they try to figure out how do we solve this problem of loneliness and in all of these areas, the loneliness strategy says we've got to figure out some practical ways for communities to get together. Now church, I just say, we have got to figure out some practical ways for us as a community to get together. I mean, if, if we want an outcome, we have to have a strategy for it, right? We have to do something. And she says, as Britain used to be, I think one of the real problems is that, uh, I guess, in, in times past, this kind of institutions non- in, in society used to provide much more places, like the church was a gathering place. Now, obviously, you have good church and bad church. I spoke to someone yesterday who, who I, I got into a conversation with, met for the first time, and we started about church and he said, man, you know, I used to go to this church and then that church. And I said, well, why, why do you stop going? He said, man, it just got all about money. It got all about p- politics. And I said, man, that, I said, champ, that, that's not the way church is supposed to be. That is not what it's supposed to be about. And I said to him, why don't you give it another go? Invite him to come here. So I hope to see him. Maybe he's here. Welcome if you made it. But hey, we, what are the practical things? Uh, you know, this is what happened in our street yesterday, actually. This is our little street in, in Chiswick. Um, and this was a picture I took yesterday morning from one of our windows down across the street to our neighbor's garden. You can see it's a bit of a mess, right? That is not the best view you can have in London. But this family moved in there. They're from Syria. I mean, not Syria, from Libya 
and been living there. The landlords mucked them around forever. And um, we had a little drinks party in our street. Now, this is interesting. We talk about practical ways of getting our communities together. So a few years ago, we just realized, as most of us probably do, we just neighborhood connection. I mean, it's great for the government to say, let's have some practical ways of getting the community together. But what does that, where does that start? Well, Ali and I felt a few years ago, well, maybe what we could do is just invite people for a drinks hour at Christmas, Christmas drinks. We made a little note, passed it to everyone in our little street and said, hey, we're having Christmas drinks at our house at seven o'clock, whatever, a few, a couple of weeks before Christmas. We wondered who would show up. And a few ladies came in. We had a nice time, but, you know, then one or two men joined us. This was a few years. Over the years, now we're having uh, a, at least a street barbecue in our street every year. We just bring in barbies right into the street, block off the street. We have drinks parties. Once on last Sunday, we had one at five o'clock. We had drinks in the street for an hour. And in the street, someone said, well, hey, what's happening with that garden? How many of you know it's easy to complain? All right, here's, a, here's, a, here's something we're going to set in this house. If you have a complaint about anything, you are required to have two things attached to the complaint. This will help you in relationships. This is for free. Always have add a suggestion to fix it or express your preference of what you actually want to the other person. All right? If it's in their power to change things. Complaints come with suggestions, preferences. Okay. Anyway, so we said, well, why don't we all get together and help them fix it up? Just do it. So here's the end of the day yesterday. Check it out. This was awesome. You know, little, this is, this is amazing. So France and Deb and their kids and Ellie and I, and, and uh, we just put little letters through the, everyone's door. This is the team that cleaned up that garden yesterday. Do you know what this did for our street yesterday? This was amazing. I mean, the buzz in that group, we're having tea. There's the tea on, on some of the rubbish there. I mean, Deb baked a cake for everybody. Up, Deb's up there in France. And, and I don't know. You know, when we do community, when we do community right, it's, it's an amazing thing. Now, this is in our community, but obviously we also as church want to figure out how do we do community. So this is a video I was sent yesterday by one of our Student Connect groups. Okay, they don't know that I'm going to show this. They went out. This is our Student Connect group. They went out for a, had a day out. And this is how, how they do community. All right, here we go. Okay, so some of the girls and I are um, from my Connect group. We're on a little retreat to the Downs. And we thought we'd be like Wolfie and give you some truth from nature. So um, what we want to remind everyone on Facebook or whoever watches this to do is to keep going and to drill it in. When I say keep, you guys say going, all right? So keep going, keep going. God bless you guys. <laughs> keep going. I mean, couldn't have said it better myself. All right, so... Let's talk today about there is more. Everyone say there is more. And uh, we want to talk today quickly about uh, there is more through being in a part of a community. And community isn't just us hanging out together in the same place. It's much deeper than that. I want to share a couple of introduction truths with you. Dan's going to come talk to us a bit about what community looks like as an, an example of community from the scripture. And then we'll look at individuals in community. But community really is this idea of the condition of sharing or having certain attitudes or interests in common, okay? It's more than just being in a same place together, but there's something about sharing some attitudes, having some interests in common, doing something, being there, having a purpose. So I want to go through just a quick bunch of truths with you quickly about what that might look like for us, okay? Here we go. Let's just think about this. London is a lonely place. I've said that together but already, but it does not have to be that way. The government has appointed a minister of loneliness, but man, let's be ministers of community building, right? Let's be community builders, all right? Let's be the friends we want the, we want to have. Let, let's, it doesn't have to be this way. And some of you, one of my deepest pastoral pains, and I know for all, I speak for all of our Connect Group leaders, pastors, is when I hear people of 
just being lonely. It's, it's one of those deep pains. And that's why we, we, today is important as we think about how do we do community? How do you do community well? But there are a couple of things. Two are better one than one, right? That's not just for marriage. That is for life. The Ecclesiastes, the wise man warns, Woe to him or her who is alone when he falls and does not have another to lift him up. Right? Woe. That's a, like an old Bible word. Woe. Be careful that you don't walk alone because here's the deal. You are going to fall sometime. You know, somebody commented to me yesterday who didn't get involved in our little cleanup. And he said, why don't they do their own work? This is one of, you know, it's not all, everyone's not going to be happy about what you do. Why don't they do it themselves? I said, listen, I looked at him and I said, listen, we all need help sometimes. Right? Sometimes things, and this practically was just overgrown. By the way, I wish I could go back to that picture. But if you looked at the, the after picture, one of my beautiful moments yesterday was late in the evening looking out the window when I took that picture. There were two kids playing football in the back of that field. They hadn't played football in that field for years. In the garden, sorry. It looked like a field once we finished with it. Hey, France, France led the charge in the back there. Okay, but hey, don't let you, this is careful. The man who isolates himself or the woman is not wise. It's just not wise to walk alone. Okay, we are better together. Getting closer to the right people will get you closer to God. You want to get closer to God? Get closer to the right people. Not just any people, the right people. Right? That's why making having all sorts of friends is wonderful, but having the right friends is also very important. And just by the way, getting closer to God will also get you closer to people. People are never going to solve all our problems. You know, there was this kid who once was praying and said, oh, Mom was praying with the stories told. Mom was praying with him. Um, he, was, he came into the room and, and, and said, I'm afraid, Mommy, in the dark. Mommy said, don't worry, go back to sleep. Jesus is with you. And the kid said, yeah, I know Mommy is with me, but I need Jesus with skin on right now. You know? We need, we can say that there's both. We need both, right? We need God and God in people. Uh -huh. And then there are two, then this promise, wherever two or three get together in my name, there I am, there I answer, Jesus says in Matthew. There's a God ordained that there would be power in agreement. So when you do step into community, into agreement, something happens, synergy happens. Something is released in your life that you simply cannot find on your own. That's why coming together like this is powerful. When we fellowship together, we stir up love and good works, okay? And then this promise, God puts the lonely in families. He's called a church, the family, man. If Please, folks, if you read the back of this thing here, you'll see one of our values is connecting. All right. That means we want every single person to experience the authentic love of God through us. If you don't experience that there, we are failing. Right? This is the if we don't love well, man, we, 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 we are not. We are nothing. All right. And then we have no perfect connect groups. This is. If you're looking for a perfect church or perfect connect groups, we do not have them. Why? Because we have no perfect people in this church. Right? And if you are perfect, then please... Anyway, no, you come back. <laughs> come to follow course. We'll, you are not perfect. All right? But it's like we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for authenticity. You and I and us, every single person, we have the saying, you can come as you are, right? But thank God that because of Jesus, none of us have to stay as we are. Right? We can all grow into all God's got for us. And then just this last thought, something powerful happens. Something powerful is released from heaven to earth. When we fellowship together, when we do community in Jesus' name, something very powerful happens. I'm going to ask Dan to come up and give us 10 minutes of what does community look like in the scripture. Okay, so, but what does this look like in practice? Because we all we all want this. I mean, that's a powerful story, isn't it? Of, of just changing your neighborhood, changing one person's 
environment, getting together, changing the house, and then being blessed by that. But what does this community look like in practice? What is it supposed to look like? Well, the best place, if you want to find what something should look like, get as close to Jesus as you possibly can. If you want to find out what disciples are supposed to look like as they live together, get to get and look at Jesus and look at what his early disciples look like. So we see in the early church, right after the day of Pentecost, as, as the numbers of disciples increasing, we see this amazing picture of how they live together. So we're going to look at Acts 2, um, Acts 2.42, and let's just read it together. Let, let's all read it, shall we? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You know, I want to encourage you, if you're not anywhere in your Bible at the moment, like maybe you haven't actually picked it up or you're just skipping around, you're not quite sure where to go, pick up the book of Acts, read through the book Acts. Because I tell you what, if we want to experience there is more in this church, in this city, it, if it looked like the book of Acts, I think that would be there is more, right? So start reading that and start, start seeing what you can learn from it. But Acts is the book, the Acts of the Apostles where the early church got about life in following Jesus. And we can see how they did that. But it starts right at the beginning with with the day of Pentecost, where they gathered together, they waited on God, they prayed, they were filled with the Spirit, they went out and preached the message. Peter went out and preached, and 3,000 people were saved and added to the church just before this. So when it says all the believers, that's a lot of people. That's suddenly gone from, from... well, 11 to 120 who are waiting, to 3,000 people added to their number. So straight away, that, that blows your mind um, for, for what we think like comfortable churches, right? It, it wasn't always comfortable and convenient. It took them right outside of their comfort zones in terms of what they could do, what they could provide for. Um, and I'm trusting that we're going to have some of that in this city. I'm, I'm trusting that you might not be able to sit in your favorite seat any longer because all the people were coming. Um, but, you know, what God is, does is very good, but it's probably not comfortable. But how do they respond to this togetherness? How do they respond to these new people that they maybe didn't even know it's all coming in? How do they respond to some of the needs and the challenges that were experienced as these 3,000 people were added into the church? They responded by loving one another radically with the love of Jesus that they had experienced. And I love this passage of scripture and we return to it often when we talk about connect groups, when we talk about the church, because it reveals what the church truly is and is supposed to be. Because the church is not an organization. The church is not a meeting. The church is not just every nation London meets together at 10.30 in the, the Drew Theatre on Imperial, Cos- Imperial Campus. That, that's not who we are. And, Guys, we're going to need to know that and remember that as we get on the move to who knows where, right? But that is not the church. The church is a devoted people of God who gather together because we have love for one another because of Jesus. We gather together around the message of Jesus, around the apostolic teaching about how we are called to live together. And we love one another. The church is actually a family. We were singing earlier, you know, that in my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. You know, if you're a child of the father, that means you have brothers and sisters right around you. No matter what your experience might have been so far, no matter what you grew up, it means that you have a family. And... You know, we all know that not every family is a functional one, right? Some of us have grown up in some families that are quite dysfunctional. I would include myself in that. But here we see an amazing picture of what a good, healthy, functional family looks like. It's a community 
gathering together. In fact, the word that they actually use there, they devote themselves to the fellowship, they devoted themselves to the community, is actually the word koinonia, but it, it talks about a, a community which is, has some intimate togetherness. It's a people that, that do life together, have a lot in common. It talks about uh, being having a mutual contribution to a mutual endeavor for mutual benefit. What does that mean? It's like, well, as we do stuff together, it means that things are better because we're doing life together. It means that I have stuff to bring that blesses you and you have stuff to bring that blesses me. And whether we gather in settings like this or we gather in our groups across the city or any time you get together with other believers, there's something that you have to receive and there's something that you have to bring. But that's what we see happening here. What also do we see? We see relationships that go beyond scheduled meetings. Yes? They, they actually meet together daily. They can't get enough of meeting together. Maybe it's not always like that for you. I know some people are more into people than others. Sometimes it's just, I just need my space. But you know what? Sometimes living like this means overcoming that preference, like I need my space, and actually saying, you know what, but there's somebody else who needs something that I've got. It means going beyond my preference. It means going beyond my convenience. And you know, when it, we talk about relationships that go beyond scheduled meetings, we, I think there's a mindset in this city which needs to be broken. Because I think it's actually a lie that we can't do this in this city. And you hear it all the time. London is too busy. London is too hard. People live too far away. And, and we just can't live like that. Oh, it would be so nice, but maybe we should move somewhere smaller and then, you know, then we'll be able to live like this. No, I, I, I believe it's possible to live this way in London. Why? Because I've experienced it. But see, but think about it. If we're talking about relationships that go beyond scheduled meetings, and this modern technology stuff makes that really easy, doesn't it? I mean, I, do you know you can actually use this to phone people? I know this is a radical thought, but you can actually speak to somebody with this device and, and you have a conversation, you know? But you have WhatsApp groups and Facebook Messenger and whatever platform you use. You know, we, we can share, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We can do that. Now, sometimes there's going to be a cost. Sometimes I need to show up in person and care and somebody has a need and we need to find a way to meet it. So there is a cost to that. It's not always simple. But again, it's care that goes beyond our convenience. We see a place for all to give and receive. If you are here, you have things that you need and you have things to give as well. And in that giving and receiving, they found they didn't need to worry about their own needs. Because every family member has something to give and something to receive. You know, sometimes sometimes I have conversations with people and people come up to me because I'm a pastor and they describe a situation that somebody's going through and they say, could the church do something about that? Or like, what is the church's response to that? Now, I want to say, as a church, we do have, if you're talking about financial needs and practical things, we, we do have some things in place that can offer a safety net when there is no other answers, right? So there's financial need, we have some food vouchers, we, we have things that we can do. But I think more importantly, what I love to hear is when I hear the stories of the church working, I love it as a pastor when I hear somebody was in need and their connect group got together and served them practically or gave to them and I want to tell you I'm, I know people in this church that there are radically generous people in this church I hear people giving finances I hear people giving cars I hear people making their places available for, for when, when somebody hasn't got somebody to stay you know, this, this is the church working this is what it looks like and because this was happening, it said no one has needs. In fact, if you go forward to Acts 4, it says as they continue to do this, even some people sold their property that they didn't really need, and they pulled all the money together. And it says there were no needy people among them. I wonder what needs you have right now. Because I found that God tends to work through people. It doesn't always just rain it down through the sky. Sometimes we actually need to live life close enough to people that they know what our needs are. 
sometimes we actually need to pull the masks down and say, actually, you know what? I'm struggling here. But we don't like to do that because we live in a very independent, self-sufficient society. I, mean, I, I grew up and, and I life taught me that I needed to rely on myself and I needed to provide for myself. And if I didn't, then it wasn't going to happen you know what, I've, I've had to try to unlearn a lot of that stuff. And the more I unlearn that, the more I experience what it means to simply be a child of God in his family. But you have needs that other people could meet. But also you have things that could meet other people's needs. What have you got? And again, sometimes this is a challenge, even on the finances. This is a chance because financial wisdom says you build up your reserves, you build up your savings and all of that sort of stuff. And, and that's good financial wisdom. Be a good steward. Save. But don't cling on to those reserves in a way that means like, well, what am I going to do if I run into trouble? I see you've got a need, but I need this here. That's not what kingdom living looks like. God's going to challenge you sometimes. Say, you know what? I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I don't need this right now. And you do. And when I find myself in the situation of need, well, I get to receive the benefits of living in church, family, and community. You know, so I, I love what this looks like. And I think London needs what this looks like. London needs this. I, I love it because it's what I've experienced. It's my story. For the sake of my 10 minutes, I won't go into all the details of that. But, but I remember... As, particularly as a teenager, after my parents had divorced, after my mum was really struggling financially, as we were emotionally struggling, we were in a church that loved us. And it was because of the church community around us that we didn't have any needs, financially and practically. It's because of the church community around us that I learned what, what friendships actually were and how they worked, what family is and how that works, what fathers are supposed to be like look like and I, I am who I am today because I've been in this Acts 2 church community and, and I don't have to be the only one, I'm not the only one but you can experience that too if you devote yourself to this community and this world needs it you need it, I need it and it's the most powerful thing in the world, you know there is more and I am convinced if we live more this way we will see God do there will be more and more amazing stories. We will see more and more people saved and added to the church. Because when they see this love in action, that's the most powerful thing in the world. Do you know what I also love about Acts 2 and that community? We can do it. It's actually not difficult. It's quite simple. It's not complicated. It's not always easy. It's not easy to lay down our selfishness, if we're honest. To put the other people's needs first. It's not easy, but it is simple. And it is doable. You don't need any special skills to have it, to do it. You don't need to have loads and loads of resources. You just need to be available with what you have. And God will use it. God will bless it. And you'll experience the benefits as well when you come to it and you say, do you know what, I don't think I've got anything. That's part of experiencing this community. So just finally, what, what will it take? What will it take? It's going to take, guys, it's going to take devotion. I'm challenged time and time again by that word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, the breaking the bread and prayers. You know, that devotion... It's really interesting as I look at that. That word literally means to persist, to persevere in, to continue steadfast in, literally to keep going. That's our vision focus this year, isn't it? Keep going. And I want to encourage us. Let's all live this way. Let's keep going in community. Because there are going to be some things that come along that disrupt that. There's going to be some things that come along that make it hard. But sometimes we've got to keep going. Sometimes we've got to start going again. As we launch connect groups, maybe you once used to be in a connect group and it became a little bit hard and you, you dropped out of that or dropped out of kind of doing life together with people. I encourage you in this season, get going again. 
and keep going in this radical community. And we'll be amazed at what God does. If we devote ourselves to living like this and drawing others into this, then we will change the world. Amen. Good, Dan. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. So that was a picture of community. Are you inspired by that? Now, interesting, when we look at this brochure, it says four ways you can stay in touch. Oh, no, sorry. It says discover your next steps. And one of those is the first one is do a follow course. Okay, join us four weeks if you're new. It's a great place to start experiencing community for four weeks and grow. But the next one is visit a connect group. Now, one of our leaders responded when he saw how I'd written this. We'd written this because it says uh, these meet regularly all across London. See the online connect group finder for the one most convenient for you. He had an issue with the word convenient. He said that doesn't set anything up like what Dan's just said. That's not convenient, right? And I said, well, this is just for guests. Okay, you got to. Like, let's at least make you feel it's easy. Okay, it's simple, but it won't always be easy. Convenient is not what we're looking for here. We're looking for something different. Let's just spend a few minutes before we get our connect group leaders up here and then lead into communion, looking at you in community. Just one text quickly and a couple of points from this. In Philippians, because listen, a community is wonderful. It's, we're talking about the group, but what about you in the group? Okay, you in the group. What? What is it going to take from you and I in our groups, in our communities? Okay, so Paul writes to about a guy called Epaphroditus. I don't know if you should name your kid that every time, but um, anyway, it's a powerful word. Sounds like Wolfgang, right? Meanwhile, I thought I should send you Epaphroditus back to you. He's a true brother, co-worker, and a fellow soldier. This is what Paul says about him. And while he and he was your messenger to help me in my need, they had some needs. They said we can trust this dude. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you and he's been very distressed that you heard he was ill. This guy is not all about me, me, me. He's like, man, I want to see you guys and it's not all about me. All right. This is what it sort of takes. And then a couple of verses later, welcome him in the Lord's love with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve. It seems Paul is holding up this Epaphroditus as an example. And he says, hey man, this dude, he is someone you can emulate okay but just quickly just three things that you want to notice about him and think about it for yourself the three things that paul highlights about him is this he says he is my he is my brother my true brother he's my co-laborer or co-worker and he's a fellow soldier these three aspects of him i just want to encourage us i just have this prophetic picture of of seeing a this is the cocoon sort of thing. And some of you, I just feel to say some of us need to become, be open to becoming more of who we are. You know, this isn't sort of a progression. You're a brother. Some of us are progress to soldiers or workers and others are soldiers. These aren't. Um, sort of levels, but they are facets of a person, right? It's like I am not like you don't start. Well, I'm a, I'm a son, and then I'm a husband, then I'm a father. Those are, it's not progression. Those are just different things of a, who I am, right? They're just different facets. It's not the one's not more important than the other. But as 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 you think about your own life, I just want to say to you, there is more to you. There is more to come out of the cocoon. Don't live so, let's not live so one dimensionally. Paul looks at this guy and says, man, he is a true brother. That means he knows how to love well, relate well, connect well. He does relationships well. He is a co-laborer. We work together. We serve together. We do stuff together. When we join our gifts and our talents, we contribute together and we can build more together than we could on our own. Then he says, but uh, we're not just brothers and builders. We also battle together. We are on a mission together. We live for something. And when you talk about battle language, that means we even sacrifice something for a greater cause. I just want to prophesy over you and I and us that in this next season, <laughs> we will become better lovers. Right? We relationally, some of you need to deal with your stuff in your relationship. 
Some of you are having relational issues. You're just trying to bury them, but they're just getting worse and worse and worse. This week, you've got to forgive some people. You've got to go to some places and deal with some offense. People that you see across the aisle and you, oh, I don't want to talk to that person. I'm sitting on this side today. If there is that sort of stuff in you, deal with it. Become a true brother. Jesus cares about that. I mean, Jesus says, look, you come to the altar and you go to issues with your brother. Leave your gift there. Go and sort it out. And I'm just saying to us, let's become true brothers, true sisters, true family. I loved Rico's testimony last Sunday where he said when Jesus came into his life, the atmosphere in the home changed. Did you hear that? You can watch it on YouTube. It's, it's just That's what Jesus does. He changes us. Love one another as I have loved you. And then we build together. Do not bury your talents in this next season. Last time I checked in the Bible, that was not a good idea. You were not created just to be a consumer, but a contributor. You have gifts and talents. Come on. We labor together. When every part does its share, there is more. And then let's fight together. Get some spiritual strength in you. If you need to grow spiritually, get to the follow course. Continue your follow journey. Let's equip you. Grow. Let's, let's grow to be warriors in the house. Not fighting with one another, but fighting for something greater that is worth fighting for. Let's be, we be those who, who, who love well, who serve well together, and who wage a good warfare together, who stand for something together. We're on a mission together. I want to thank you for being on the mission together, but let's, let's do that well. And um, let's be able to have this testament about our lives. If you feel your life is narrow, I want to encourage you, be little bold in this next season don't compare yourself to anyone else but be inspired by others you don't have to compare yourself to anybody else but do be inspired i did the park run yesterday 5k run man i'm not comparing myself to the other 500 people but i'm inspired by some of those kids that are running past me ladies that not to be sexist but ladies that are running past me because I'm just inspired to go and train a little bit. Ouch. Come on. 